Oh, welcome to Behind the Bastards, a podcast about the worst people in all of history. And also, at the same time, a podcast where I explore my Boston accent and see how much better I can make it. And 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 to help me today, we have professional Boston coach, Jeff May. Jeff, welcome to the program. Hey there, kid. What's going on? Wow. Incredible. You see now, that? Of course, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I prefer, I prefer to do my accent a little bit more authentic. Let me, let me run this one by you, Jeff. Oh God! Oi, crikey! I'm from Boston. Jeez, that's real. That's more of a North Shore accent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that's it's what, that's what a lot of close. people say. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. No, that mm-hmm. that's that's very much if you were to go up to like you know like Malden or something like mm-hmm. really get up there. Um, that's where you have. That, uh, yeah. So the regional Jeff- dialect is wild out there. Critical question. Brockton, yes. part of Boston or not? Yeah, of course. I mean, really? look, okay, I'll put, <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. That's, wait, wait. So that you're on Jamie, you're on Jamie's side of this. How much is she paying you? But let me. <laughs> that hot dog cackle books. was for so my, many hot that dog. cackle was for in honor of Jamie. But well, here's the thing, though. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Is that I live 3000 miles away from my hometown, right? So if where I am now and people ask where I'm from, I tell them Boston. In reality, I'm from a small farming hamlet in central massachusetts called charlton uh regionally related to worcester massachusetts so it's hard for me when people are like jeff's from boston and i'm like yeah and then when someone presses me a little bit i'm like okay not really though um but i've always counted i mean because brockton brockton's like the sort of heart of fighting in boston which is something that i did uh, that makes sense that makes sense so i relate that I've been as in being brockton like, once and i did want to fight somebody everyone would have fought you there <laughs> Je- jeff's boston accent was so much better than yours robert i'm sorry his was really wow. strong it wow. was strong it wasn't regionalized Thank well you. but it yeah. was strong yeah yours was very marky mark macky mac yeah. oh, the friggin walbert you should do an Mackie episode on Mack. him that was Mackie so, Mack, that was the so Walbers. good the only people that like the Wahlbergs yeah, we, are the people did. that are related to the Wahlbergs. Have you ever eaten at a Wahlbergers? I would rather fucking die. It is absolutely... Is that a real place? I, I don't want to be mean, but it is the worst burger I've ever had in my okay. entire well, life. Well, so, you know, I think a, a Mark Wahlberg getting a burger chain is evidence of of yeah. one of the many crimes of capitalism. And you know what? who hated capitalism? Oh. Donnie Wahlberg. <laughs> that might be true, but also the subject of today's episode, Nikolai Ceausescu, dictator of Romania. We just start doing an entire thing about the Wahlberg family and never get to the actual topic. I wouldn't put that. Yeah. I could do it. I could do. I could do an hour. I know Related you could. Bastards. <laughs> I mean, we, we are talking about one corrupt family and another corrupt family. So yeah. the Ceausescus and the Wahlbergs. Who's who has caused more death and destruction? So Robert. Impossible I need to you, say. I need you to say welcome to and and you're ready for it. Go behind the bastards. <clears throat> welcome to behind the bastards. No, that's, that's wow. not it. That was you nailed it. Oh, Thank don't you. Encourage him. Thank you, Jeff. I, I got to be Thank 100. You. Like I thought that you had just replayed what I said back to me. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I I've, I've, I've been practicing my mimicry, like whatever kind of bird mimics things. You're like a, a mockingjay. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Jeff, what do you know about Nikolai Ceausescu? I try to not know as much as I can about Romanian people. <laughs> <laughs> I know that he wore that a, lo- a, so lot of, a lot of nylon sweatsuits. Uh, he had a lot of cologne on. Yeah, uh, I mean, look, if you want, I mean, because Romania is kind of like edge of the Balkans, right? Sometimes it's considered part of the Balkans. Some people will be like, nah, it's Eastern Europe's not really in the Balkans. Whatever. I, uh, this is not the place to litigate that. But what you can say, what I can say about Romanians, which I can also say about Serbians and Bosnians and um, um, uh, a, a number of other people in that area, is that their oh, tracksuit game is incredibly strong. <laughs> Unbelievable. You, it's like they're like you, extras in yeah. the Sopranos. Yeah, it's amazing. If you want an, if you've got an Adidas, a good Adidas tracksuit in that part of the world, you're basically a king. Um, just squatting and smoking cigarettes, it rules. It, Romania is an interesting country. Um, and Nicolae Ceausescu is interesting because, you know, we've got all these, like, communist dictators like Stalin, 
um, who there are a lot of folks today, particularly on the internet, who will defend these guys. A lot of like weird authoritarian communists who, uh, who, who have never met a dictator they don't like. And one of the things that's interesting about our subject today, Ceausescu, is that he is the one that no one will defend. I mean, I'm no. sure you can find a couple of Ceausescu stands out there, but there, almost nobody yeah. will back this guy up because he sucked so comprehensively. It's um, funny. It's, it's funny when it's you look at the yeah when you look at the old Soviet bloc and you look at like some of the dictators they had and you look at the old the like the older people that lived through it and they're like, well, you know, sometimes you have to make hard decisions and it's like hard. The guy killed like a hundred thousand people and they're like, well, you know, ruling is difficult. Uh, it is very interesting to see the apologists of like the really terrible people in, in Russia. They're just like, sometimes you settle for a despot. It happens. Uh, (laughs) I like what I do like is that he, his fate was sealed on, I believe if I recall correctly, Oh yes. Christmas. Yeah, he was it, it, him being murdered was a Christmas present for the whole Romanian nation right. and yeah. really the world. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. So we're going to talk about Nicolae Ceausescu, but we're also going to have to talk about Romania and, and give some history because I don't think most Americans know a lot about Romania. Um, it's a, a part of the world that, you know, it, it, it's interesting because like there was a period of time where Ceausescu was kind of like the good communist. He was very close friends with Richard Nixon. Um, he was That's spoken of positively by, by Ronald Reagan. It's amazing. He's like Ooh. a Stalinist who Nixon loved and Reagan was like, he's a good guy. It's, it's wild stuff. Those are two um, people whose endorsements <laughs> I could go without. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, So but before we get into how he came to power and what he did, we're going to have to talk a little bit of history because there's some there's some context that is important if you're going to understand how a guy like what do you know that he was when he was younger, he was extremely hot. That we can discuss, Sophie. I, I, I definitely don't see that because he looks like a Muppet as he gets older. Uh, he ages like a like Muppet. A, yeah, that's yeah. Romania. A hot yeah. Muppet. Yeah. <laughs> it's, all, it's the land of the Muppets. Yeah. Um, well, it was known as Dacia, uh, D-A-C-I-A, back in the day in like the classical period. Um, if you've ever seen like read a book about the Roman Empire and it talks about them fighting the Dacians and conquering the Dacians, that's Romania prior to Roman contact. Um, Dacia is like one of the last provinces that gets conquered by the Roman Empire, and it's one of the first they abandon. So they're only only hang around there for a little bit less than 300 years, and then they leave in 275 BC. I do like um, the fuck this energy that they bring to living in Romania. <laughs> yeah. eh, it's too dark, too many mountains. Yeah. There's like uh, vampires they, are going to be a thing here. They're, yeah, they're like, we conquered a lemon. We got to get the hell out of yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> well, they kind of get out of here. Obviously, like we talk about, oh, the Roman Empire conquers this place or leaves this place. It, it, 275 BC, when the Roman Empire leaves, most people live in the region probably would not have noticed much of a change because for one thing they're still trading with the romans there's still a lot of roman soldiers in the region and in fact the the reason that we call it romania now is because the like roman soldiers who were stationed there like bred with the local population and this is something they're they're pretty proud of like it, romania like the name romania is kind of hearkening back to the fact that there is a lot of roman ancestry in the nope. area now this um, ties back so, to f- yeah for everyone that took like seventh and eighth grade languages remember when you would take like an introduction to like spanish or french or, or latin yeah. or whatever and they would say you know whatever language you're learning spanish or french they're like they're one of the five romance languages that's my that's where i'm from in massachusetts that's the accent yeah. and it's like you hear spanish french portuguese italian and romanian and when they say Romanian, you're like, what? Like, why? Like, why? Why them? That doesn't make sense on a map that mm-hmm. that would be the language. Not yeah. Even. Yeah. It, it is weird, especially since, it, again, if you're in that region and, and further into the Balkans, the, the language they're speaking is very different. Right. But but in Romania, it is this kind of like Latinized tongue. Um, so that's cool. Um, Roman romance. Uh, there's nothing as sexy as a, as a man making a pizza and doing violent hand gestures. I mean, so, you're not uh, wrong about that. Yeah. 
Um, the center of Roman Dacia is a place that is known today as Transylvania. That's actually like the province that the Romans conquer. So again, when I say they left because of Dracula, that's that is historically true. Um, although Dracula Not a good dude d- didn't exist yet. Yeah, we're going to talk about him for just a little bit. Like, here. Did you do? A, have um, you done Vlad yet? Vlad Tepes? No, no, no. But we are kind of doing a little bit of Vlad Tepes right now. Um, right. Let me tell so, you real quick. I know you're about to do that, but as somebody who taught about the Middle Ages. And I used to do for my literacy classes, I would have them write a research paper and I'm like, you can pick anybody. I'm so I got so burnt out reading yeah. <laughs> term papers from eighth graders about Vlad Tepes. And it's not that he's not interesting. It's just that it's boring when you read the same paper 30 times a year. Well, well, Jeff, I'm going to try to give you a little bit different of a paper because we're going to be focusing on a slightly an aspect of Vlad's time running Romania um, that people don't tend to talk about as much. Obviously, the thing everyone knows about Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler, is that he impaled a bunch of people, specifically a bunch of Ottoman soldiers. And if you like hang out and and read sort of the the weird uh, right wing kind of retellings of, of medieval history, a lot of them will focus on him as like the shield of the West. And this is something that like within the Romanian right wing, it gets talked about a lot that like Romania was the, the, the what protected you know Christendom from the Ottoman Empire and, and Vlad Tepes you know was this was this heroic figure who who was hard enough in order to like keep the Muslims out like this Charles is Martel not actually in France, yeah yeah this is not accurate to the actual history pieces of it are accurate but the broad picture is wrong um so first off his name was legitimately Vlad Dracula uh, because his his dad was Dracul, which was a name he got when he got given an award by the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor. I think it was Sigismund. Um, and Dracula means son of the dragon because Dracula means the dragon. Um, but it also at the same time means son of the devil, which is why the guy who wrote the Dracula book uh, thought he was he was a good pick for a, a, a horrible monster character I, name. I like that you were um, like the guy. Like he like his name isn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. That dude. What's his name? Bram, the Dracula guy, but not Dracula. Sharon Lois and yeah, Bram, Bram Stoker, Stoker. Yeah, the the guy who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That from Bram wrote Stoker's that shitty vampire book, the first Twilight, we could say the pre the yeah the uh, the prelude to Twilight, before we we really figured out what we wanted from our vampires. Um, Sparkles and so, chiseled abs. Mm hmm. That's right. That's right. No cum gutters on the original Dracula, uh, probably because he was he was riddled with various diseases. So I want to I want to see Gary Oldman have like a huge six pack in that movie with that stupid <laughs> little hairdo. But he's just like, see, th- check out my rippling abs. This is the thing we should be using that AI shit to do is go back and go back to like movies that were made decades ago and give the male leads back then who didn't have access to modern fitness technology just unbelievably shredded cum gutters. Like go back to to uh, uh, what is it? Gone with the Wind and, yeah. and throw some cum gutters in a uh, in uh in in red and throw yeah. some cum uh, throw some cum gutters on that guy who dies too you know the 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 confederate yeah. boy soldier yeah. i would like to cum see gutters all of them the rock in to kill a mockingbird like the rock yeah, is to Atticus kill a rockingbird yeah where he actually just kills everybody in town in order to stop that guy from getting gives him the, tried the rock murder. bottom as they're trying to they take yeah. out yeah mm-hmm Mm-hmm. I think that's a good idea. Also, put Stone Cold Steve Austin in uh in that 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 uh the the oh shit now I've I'm, you've gone I've, I've off the, name the, of the rails. Movie. Citizen Kane, we could do that. No, no, Rose no. Bar, what is it? The, the, movie now, the movie, the movie where uh, that guy goes to Washington D.C. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. <laughs> yeah, that man throw, goes to Washington. Yeah, throw Mr. throw Stone Cold Steve Austin and Mr. Smith goes oh. to Washington and have him do a Stone Cold Stunner and all those old Congress yeah. fools. What Stone is, Cold Smith goes to uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. What does this have to do with our script? Very le- very very little. So, uh, the actual historical Dracula, who is kind of your first. Like he he's often seen as like one of kind of the founding figures of Romania uh, in like Romanian nationalist discourse because he's kind of this this first figure on the scene and this is back when Romania is called Wallachia who becomes super famous um and he becomes famous yeah for the impaling people um Vlad Tepes is uh, the ruler of Wallachia on three non consecutive occasions which happens a lot actually in in their history at this point they've got this weird system that by which they they 
pick who their ruler is going to be, where you have these, basically the, this group of nobles who gets to vote on who's going to run things. And it leads to a shitload of turnover. From 1418 to 1476, Wallachia has 11 princes who are in power for about five years each. So he gets into power, gets thrown out of power, comes back into power several times. Um, Common in and Europe. This, yeah, common in Europe, um, but in Romania, it is a particularly like violent system, and this makes sense when you look at just kind of where Romania is located, right? Not only are they right next to the Ottoman Empire, but they're right next to Hungary uh, and the Holy Roman Empire, and there's just they are just constantly dealing with different groups coming in and trying to basically run things. Um, so it, it's not only the, the the Ottomans that they're fighting, and uh, repeatedly, Romanian leaders will side with the Ottomans in order to protect themselves against the Hungarians or whatever. Like, this is a, a common thing. So so Dracula, like actual Vlad Dracula, spends a decent chunk of his career fighting alongside the Ottomans. He also, at, for a, po a point of it when he's technically a vassal to the Ottomans, is leading like an illegal underground war against them. All this stuff is going on. But I think what's more to the point is that rather than kind of being a shield against like the Muslim world who is defending Christendom. Vlad is more concerned with maintaining his relative independence from an ocean of surrounding threats who covet Transylvania um, and the rest of Romania. Um, Transylvania is specifically the area that the Romanians fight with the Hungarians over a lot, and it changes hands all the fucking time. And he is a pretty brutal, Vlad Dracula is a pretty brutal ruler to his own people. And this is the thing that gets discussed less. We talk about the impaling of all of these uh, these Ottoman soldiers as he's trying to like throw back this invasion from the Sultan. And I want to quote now from the wonderful book Children of the Night by Paul Kenyon, because this was a little piece of Dracula history that I hadn't heard. It was around this time, during the first couple of years of Dracula's rule, that he organized a notorious feast for all the beggars of Targoviste. The event appeared to be a great humanitarian gesture. The hall was hired and tables were filled with food and wine. Invitations were put out around the city to the cripples, the blind, the diseased, and the destitute. They all congregated in a large wooden hall, toasting Dracula's generosity. But towards the end of the meal, someone noticed smoke coming from the walls. They ran to the door, only to find Dracula's troops had locked it from the outside and set the place ablaze. Many hundreds were trapped, and a bonfire of souls was left burning into the dark Wallachian sky. The bonfire of the beggars, as it became known, was a warning. Begging would not be tolerated. It was a drain on the finances of the most decent and generous in society, said Dracula, a crime as evil as theft. Wallachians were uneasy. It was one thing killing the rich, but to massacre the poor in such violent circumstances? On the other hand, Dracula's tactics did seem to be working, and crime fell. It was said that Dracula's guards would test the townsfolk by leaving a purse full of gold coins in a vi busy marketplace. When the guards came to collect it in the evening, the purse was always left untouched. The admiration for authoritarian solutions would also resonate down the centuries. So that yeah, is, this is kind of like, yeah. That's got to be effective because, you know, of the murder. Yeah, yeah. When you murder enough people, um, you, you you can decrease the crime rate. Um, that that is that is, and this yeah. is a lesson that no Romanian leader is ever going to forget. And yeah. it, it kind of like he, Vlad is sort of setting the tone here for an awful lot of their history, right down yeah. to the fact that you've got this kind of peasant population that is g getting mistreated by its leaders enough that many people are starving in the streets. And so the solution of the ruler is, well, what if we just light those people on fire? This would be. Be, this is like a Facebook comments section gone to life. Like this is this yeah. is what a lot of people from my hometown would like to do. Oh, to Matt Walsh is totally down for this. Yeah, oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Daily Wire is already writing a think piece on how Vlad Dracula yeah. had the right <laughs> how literal Dracula had the right idea on improving our our civic spaces. Yeah, the New York um, Times is going to post an editorial that says, mm -hmm. "Are there too many poor people?" Yeah. Question. Mark. What if we just light them on fire? You know, um, and I, I think I you know this is one of those areas where my my moral sort of uh, uh, compass is at odds with the intellectual side of me because on a moral level, I think it's always okay to set fires, but clearly sometimes fires can be bad, and and this is something I'm still grappling with, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, well, fires can have disastrous results, but fire itself is awesome. Like mm -hmm. I keep I keep fire with me when I'm recording at all times. I have to have an yeah, open flame yeah. near me or else what's the yeah. point? What if wolves came in while I was recording? This right. You're not going to keep the wolves away if you don't have a fire. 
Like I'm in San Francisco right now as we record this, and I have a fire on me at all times because famously San Francisco is a city with a wonderful history of fires that I want to celebrate. You know, yeah, all of the yeah. good fires San Francisco. It's had. called knowing your history. That's right. That's right. Um, so Romania in the years after Dracula, uh, who gets who who gets murdered uh, before he's very old? Uh, again, none of these Romanian princes last all that long. So Romania spends a lot of most of the medieval period as a vassal of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and this actually this state of affairs lasts until pretty recently. Um, the country does not get its independence until the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 to 1878. Um, it becomes an independent kingdom uh, with a Hohenzollern regent. So, you know, whenever they have these, because this happens a lot where you're, you're having these chunks of Europe become independent from either their former masters or from the Ottomans or whatever, and they all need kings, right? Because it's still the attitude in the 1800s that every new country ought to have some sort of king. So there, there's this kind of like constant, it causes a lot of conflict. This is a lot of what sets up World War One. But um, Romania, because of how close it is to Germany, winds up with a Hohenzollern region. Which, which, like, theoretically should mean that they're going to side with the Germans on everything. Um, that's actually not what happens in practice, but that's certainly what the Germans think when when they make sure Romania gets this uh, this guy who's related to the Kaiser. Um, now yeah, you're because, totally our friends, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's also the me- mess that by the time World War One rules around, like the country has this Hohenzollern king, but it also has a queen who's one of. Queen Victoria's grandchildren, which is also super common, right? Everybody's got one of Victoria's yeah. kids or grandkids somewhere in their fucking royal family. Yeah, they're collecting um, them. They're like Pokemon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and the Hohenzollerns have caught at least one. And she's actually she's actually kind of rad. Um, they have this horrible war um, in like 1912, 1913, where Romania tries, because when Romania becomes independent, they don't have... Transylvania, right? Uh, Transylvania is still property of the Hungarians. So at one point they invade Hungary right before World War One, and it goes just absolutely terribly. But uh, Queen Mary, who's this um, victorious grandkid, winds up like working as a, a combat nurse in this frontline position. And it, it, it really she becomes very beloved by the Romanian people. And she seems to be legitimately the only royal in Europe during this period of time who doesn't completely suck, because while the rest of them are starting a series of, of wars that will kill tens of millions. She's just sort of like working as a trauma nurse the entire time. <laughs> she's um, like trying so, to do good. It's yeah, funny she, too. Se- she seems dope, actually. The uh, the Hungarians, I don't know if you've ever covered this on the thing, but what you know about like their nomenclature, right? Like the history of that name. That they were just bit. the ma- so it was the, 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 Mag- they're the Magyars. The Magyars right? Yeah, so yeah. They're, they're Magyars. And then the, when people saw them, they were like, ah, they fight like the Huns. It's sort of like how we called Native Americans oh, Indians. We were oh just like, God. ah, you're Indian. It's just I that do. whole like, ah, you guys are Hungarians. You're like the Huns. And they're like, no, we are our own people. That's, that reminds me of like where the word barbarian came from, which is that the Greeks just thought everyone who wasn't Greek sounded like they were going bar, 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 bar all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's very like, oh, derka, derka, derka. And then we, yeah. Uh, yeah, racism before racism. It's, it's, it, it's that deep racism. Um, yeah, it's true, pure racism. Yeah, it's that, absolutely that, pure, uncut by the later, the, you know, the corruption that went into yeah, racism later. Yeah, <laughs> bef- bef- it, it, before racism got so commercial, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, just a bunch of guys looking at people who live over the hill near them and yeah. saying, "Sounds they they all talk weird." Yeah, yeah, they 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 did it for the love of the game. Yeah. yeah, it's the the Honus Wagner of racism. That's the that's the Europeans in this. Well, at least in in ancient history. Yeah. So um yeah uh so you got Romania. They have this disastrous war where they they try to take and the reason why they lose the war because it goes well for like a day and then everybody gets sick from mosquitoes and starts dying. <laughs> Which is not an uncommon Tales, story. In yeah, the Tales all this time, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but outside of that, when kind of World War One starts to break out, Romania is kind of in in a decent position because they've got this king, their first king, Carol, 
uh, the first, who's in charge right up until 1914, and he drops kind of right before the war drums start sounding. And the king who follows Ferdinand is is a pretty smart guy and is like, I don't think World War One's going to go well for anybody. I don't want to get involved in this shit. I just would like to, I can sell food and fuel because Romania's got a hell of a lot of oil. I'll just sell that shit to the Germans and we won't send all of our guys off to die, which is a good strategy um, and, and would have been a winner if they had stuck with it. Um, but they, they are not going to stick with it. Um, now part of the reason why the new King is kind of hesitant to get involved in world war one and doesn't want to like is because he doesn't want to risk upsetting the peasants. Um, Romanian political history in uh, this period up to pretty much the modern day, a huge amount of it is kind of based around the struggle between these urbanized populations, which are, are still a very small chunk of the country in the late 1800s, um, and the, the majority of the country, which is the peasantry. And the peasants, especially in the late uh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, are, they're not quite serfs, but they also are basically renting land from the whatever noble owns it um, and paying them kind of ruinous taxes in order to get to farm it. So it's kind of a worse situation than being a serf because they're actually like they're technically free, but they have to pay their boss being, you know, whatever nobles in charge of the area for the privilege of getting to work the land enough to produce enough food to not starve to death, which is a bad, like what the, one of the most common foods that Romanian peasants live on in this period of time is like cheese that's infested with maggots. Um, oh, yeah. that and like pickled vegetables is a lot of their, uh, that, their, their diet. Um, that's the, and the, hey, maggots the cheese, protein, that's like still, so. It's like illegal, but it's like a super delicacy from there, right? They still do that. I, I don't know if it's from Rome. I know there's a cheese in Sicily that's all maggoty. Like, I think there's probably a few different versions of it. But back in the day, it is not a nice food, right? It, it, it's. <laughs> I think maybe yeah. now it's become a delicacy. But then it's like, well, we're not going to not eat this cheese just because it's filled with maggots, because otherwise we'll die. So, I just get a little speaking of maggots. Out of it. The products and services that support this podcast will add maggots to any order you make. Hit us oh. up. Mm. We're back, and I just oh. had a, a hoagie made entirely out of maggots. Delicious. Yeah. I had a mm, maggot protein shake. It was nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maggot proteins, the cleanest burning protein out there. Um, yeah. you can't do better than maggots. That's that's uh that's the motto of this podcast. Behind the bastards, Sophie, you can't mm -hmm. do better than maggots. No, no, that's it. It's the true super feud. Uh, if, if you just all you actually need in your diet, just a, a 50 50 mix of maggots and acai berries and and you'll never die. <laughs> yeah, I looked up Kasu Marzu <laughs> just to see that's the cheese and boy, that was oh, the, the Romanian one. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like a pecorino from sheep's milk. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is not a delicacy at the time. Yeah. Um. So one of the big like reasons that uh that King Fre Frederick doesn't want to go to war, doesn't want to get involved in World War One, is because he doesn't feel like he has a good handle on the peasantry, kind of as they go into this period. And a big part of why is that there's an uprising in like 1907. Right. Which is, you know, pretty recent still in 1914. And this uprising, this peasants uprising starts because this guy named I think I, I think it's basically pronounced John uh, Dohescu traveled to a protest outside of uh, the mayor's house in a town called uh, Flamazi. And Dohescu and his fellow peasants, again, they're basically starving. This feudal system that that governs their lives is super corrupt. And the way that it works is you've got these these royals who own the land and these royals basically hire a group of middlemen to manage it for them. And so the middlemen get their money off of skimming what they can off the top. And anything they're skimming is extra shit that the peasants are paying for, right? In addition to the pretty ruinously high taxes that the royals are imposing. Um, Kenyon in his book notes that the peasantry in Romania is, quote, so comprehensively exploited that they were effectively paying their pr landlords for the privilege of working. So there's this protest outside of the mayor's house, and these peasants, including John Dohescu, wind up outside yelling at this estate manager, who's, again, kind of like this middle manager type guy. And he throws a rock at one of them, and it hits Dohescu in the eye. Um, this, for whatever reason, starts shit. You know, sometimes, like... Oh, yeah, that's going to start shit. You ever been hit in the yeah. eye with a rock? 
uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're not um, not going to throw a punch after that. No, sure, sure. But this also starts shit on a bigger scale. Like everyone gets uh, outraged on the behalf of this guy, um, which shit like this, it, I don't know, it, it happens here too. Like you'll have the same kind of horrible violence being done by the same people every day. And then one day, suddenly thousands of people take to the streets, right? Um, and and this is this is that version of that thing happening in Romania. So the peasants around Dohescu form a mob and they start going through town and attacking all of the middlemen that these local aristocrats have been using to manage their land. And for a variety of reasons, most of these middlemen are Jewish, right? That's just who the aristocracy is like, yeah, we'll have these guys. It's actually kind of a conscious decision by the aristocracy because like if you have, if like you have this group of people managing your stuff and they're all Jewish, when the peasants get angry, you can just use racism to deflect from the fact that you're really the one responsible for their suffering. Um, so that that works very well in this case. And so the peasants' revolt that follows is both an act of protest against economic exploitation that is very justified and a vicious, ra- a vicious racist pogrom that is not justified. You know um, what's funny is every time I do the show, that phrase, vicious racist pogrom, shows up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm just we, like, oh yeah, let's bring it on. Let's see, let's see who's doing terrible things to to decent people well, again. Jeff, to be fair, we keep bringing you on for episodes that are about Europe from like 1800 to 1950. So you're gonna have to talk about pogroms. It's gonna There's happen. Nowhere yeah. that doesn't have them. Yeah. A little playfully violent anti-Semitism mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. us through the day every time. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. So the Peasants' Revolt starts with these peasant mobs marching through towns, dragging Jews out of their homes, and then lighting the homes on fire. Um, But as the revolt wears on, because it's 1907, 1905, Russia's just had an unsuccessful socialist revolution. And a lot of these revolutionaries who are kind of like on on the run from the czar wind up heading over to Romania. And they start preaching to the masses that like, hey, guys the Jews as a group are not responsible for your suffering. It's the property holding class who's exploiting you. Um, and this actually has a positive impact. There's, there's less programs kind of later in the peasants uprising they and they're relaxed. more just attacking rich people. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. They relaxed a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, the whole thing comes to a head in April of 1907 when 6,000 peasants gather with axes to protest for redistribution of land. Right. And what they're protesting for is like, we we want to own the land that we live on and work our entire lives rather than it being owned by some guy who can just like jack up the rent and starve us effectively. So the government of Romania is like, absolutely not, because the people who have control of the artillery are the people who own the land. So those people just have the military fire artillery directly into the crowd, killing six, 600 people in a matter of minutes. Oh, that's um, it? By the... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. It's pretty well, actually, by the end, I mean, the whole revolt, they kill about 11,000 people. Um, so it they do they kill. That's a good number of people killed. That's pretty good. No, that's pretty good. Repressive. It's solid shit. for a few minutes, if I'm being yeah. 100 percent honest, like it's yeah. it takes Manhattan Project level shit to to get numbers like that. Uh, yeah. So quickly. Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, th- th- this is, goes on for a few months, but like 11,000 people, it's pretty bloody. So King Ferdinand, who takes over seven years after this, is like, we just tested the peasantry a little bit and it we got closer to losing control than we want to admit. So I really don't want to, like, have to conscript a bunch of people and deal with the problems that that might cause. Yeah, we dipped Um, the toes in a little bit and found out that we get butchered. So, yeah. (laughs) And staying out of World War One absolutely would have been the right call for Romania. But here's the problem, Jeff. British people exist. And British people keep whispering in the Romanian king's ear, Oi, governor, you want that Transylvania, do you? What we was, can get what, you that. What are you doing? That's New That's English. That's my English accent. What the fuck Crikey. are you doing? I'm doing, I'm doing an English accent, Sophie. He was You're like, bruv. 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 Mate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Bruv. In yeah. it. Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. Mm-hmm. We got a war coming Luton. in it. Bruv. <laughs> so... So that's what the British Empire is whispering into the ears of King Frederick. Um, and you know, basically the promise they're making him is, again, like, hey, you you guys are 
like Transylvania is majority Romanian population. It's controlled by Hungary. We agree that's unjust. If you come into the war on our side and like help us throw us a wrench in the fucking German war effort, uh, we'll make sure that you wind up with this greater Romania thing that all the nationalists in Romania are are super gung ho about when the war finally ends. Um, and eventually, this this kind of thought of getting Transylvania back and all of these others, a couple of other provinces too, is too enticing for the the king and sort of the nationalists in the Romanian government to not try to do. So in 1916, Romania enters World War I on the side of the, uh, the Entente, and they attack the Central Powers. This briefly goes well for about six weeks. Romania takes back like a bunch of Transylvania. They take a couple of other areas from, from Hungary. They're like, they're having a real good time for, for like six weeks. Um, but then... Then then the Germans show up. Now, the Imperial German Army is an army so competent that it took the entire world to beat them in this war, yeah, like literally it, everyone else. It, it's reminded <laughs> it, it's a good reminder that the German military and obviously, you know, when you trace back to Otto von Bismarck and basically his description mm -hmm. of creating a country based on the world's greatest army, like that was mm -hmm. his whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and like so like, yeah, like that's gonna be that's gonna be a big deal because they're yeah. so they're just so good at war that's been like their whole thing they've been training for this and they are the germans at this point are obviously they are tied up the two years into the war on the western front which has killed more men more quickly than probably any other war in history prior to this point they're also fighting all of russia which is a fifth of the planet's land mass not that far from romania and then romania enters and so the germans take like a tiny little chunk of their forces and they send it towards Romania and they just curb stomp them. It's like, how within, about fuck you? Like, yeah, within days it becomes clear that like, Oh, they are going to occupy the entire country. Romania will no longer be in it. Like they're coming for the capital. The Royals start fleeing, right? They are yeah. fucking getting the hell out of town. Um, and so it's the British decide, <laughs> Well, first off, this didn't work. Um, clearly, Romania did not have what it took to take the Germans yeah. out of the fight. They're, yeah, they're like, so we fucked around. Yeah. And it turns out we found out. They found out. Yeah. Um, which, you know, as the British Empire is always our preference, someone other than us find out. But now we have this problem. Romania has, like, basically the largest oil reserves in Europe, as certainly at this point. And Germany does not have any oil, right, on its own, pretty much. So... The Germans are about to gain access to these oil fields that would effectively allow them to gain an enormous material advantage in this war that is uh, kind of a squeaker. So the Germans send over or the British send over a guy, this lieutenant colonel named John Norton Griffiths, who sounds like a war crimes guy and is about to do him a war crime because he lights every oil field in Romania on fire. <laughs> Um, it's just like set it all on fire. Fuck this shit. He Oof. he does like a Saddam. Yeah, I was um, gonna say that's like Iraq. It, yeah, yeah. It like blots out the sun. It's obviously it's an ecological disaster. Um, but it's a military success. He does stop the Germans from gaining access to Romania's fuel reserves. Um, which you know is the smart play on a mill. It's just awful. Um, but yeah, yeah that's war. It's the salting um, the earth of yeah of, uh, of natural resources. Yeah. Yeah. So Romania does not do well in in World War One. Uh, they get occupied by the Germans. But a couple of years later, the Germans eventually do lose the war. And when they lose the war, Romania actually kind of winds up in a really good position. And uh, we're not going to get into like all of the wheeling and dealing that occurs. But, you know, a, a lot of folks feel like they kind of a lot of folks who side with the central powers kind of feel like they get fucked over. This is particularly an issue with the Italians, right? Where Italy's like, we did all this fucking dying fighting Austria. And we got basically nothing at the end of the war. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you people? Um, Romania does, does really well. They get Transylvania. Um, like the British, to their credit, actually do give them what they had promised here. And so after World War I, Romania is like 30 or 40 percent larger and has a substantially larger population, a whole lot of, of resources and really productive land. That's, um, that's called yeah. buying low and selling high. That's like, that's right. Like that's they're, they're right. like, we're not going to do much to help you mm -hmm. win this war, but we will reap the benefits. <laughs> they bought the dip. <laughs> yeah. Right. European civilization. Yeah. Transylvania um, to the moon. Yeah. 
So after World War I, Romania is in this really interesting position. They are subject to a lot of the same forces that are, you know, going wild in Russia. This is the height height of the Russian Civil War. Um, so the left has this huge surge in popularity. But Romania also has a pretty stable constitutional monarchy with this, like, parliamentary system, right? Um, and so because... And, I, you know, it, it, it's interesting that it works this way, but rather than kind of all of the 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 energy on the left that is obviously like plays a huge role in what happens in Russia rather than that leading to the establishment of a super radical political part left-wing political party in Romania that wants to get rid of the monarchy change the nature of the state entirely institute a socialist state they get a, a left-wing political party called the National Peasants Party um, which is is very large. I think it wins like seventy eight percent of the vote in its its most successful election. Jesus, um, and is advocating for like a lot. Well, it's because they're saying like we want land reform, right? This thing that they had just had an uprising about, but they don't ever get like an organized large communist movement. And in fact, for most of the twenties and thirties, there's maybe a thousand like organized communists in all of Romania, which is not a ton. Like there's several million people in the country. So it's it's a very small population. Now, the organized far right is a lot larger than the communist left. Obviously, it's still a, a smaller chunk of the country because Romania, the Romanian people tend to vote sort of progressive left in this period. Um, but the organized far right in Romania is very aggressive and very organized, and they start carrying a lot, out a lot of violent fascist marches and particularly attacks against the Jewish population of towns and cities. And this becomes more and more common in the 20s and 30s. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is the country and the political situation that our hero for this week, Nicolae Ceausescu, is born into on January 23rd, 1918. So he like comes into being right as this, you know, post-World War I Romania starts to be a thing. His father, whose name is Andruta, owned a small farm in a village called Scornicesti. And I'm I'm going to try on the names here. I, I listen to pronunciations. I'm not going to get all of these right, guys. I'm sorry. There's a lot of Romanian names, and I... I, I I, look, I, 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 Scornicesti is probably close enough. Uh, his dad <laughs> raised sheep and worked part time as a tailor. The family was about as poor as it is possible to be, uh, and any money that did come into them went swiftly to Andruda's drinking habit. So he is a religious extremist and an alcoholic. Um, and for myster mysterious reasons, uh, Nikolai Ceausescu is going to decide he does not want to live around this guy for much longer. Um, very shocking. Uh, so there's this journalist, a Romanian journalist, Catalin Gruya, uh, who interviewed people in Ceausescu's hometown after his demise. Here's what he writes about Andruda. He didn't take care of his kids. He stole. He drank. He was quick to fight, and he swore, said the old priest from Scornicesti. His mother was a submissive, hardworking woman. The family slept on benches along the walls of a two-room house. Corn mush was their staple food. Nikolai went to the village school for years. The teacher taught simultaneous classes for different years in a one-room schoolhouse. The young Ceausescu did not have books, and he often went to school barefoot. An outsider from early on, he did not have friends. He was anxious and unpredictable. You brought a lot of Boston energy to the beginning there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. He was you. just like, I, his I father tried. was a drinker. He was, he a, fucking, he was, he was drunk. quick to fight all the time. Always down at the chowder house. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Very good. Mm -hmm. Getting into fights at the Duncan. Um, yeah, and Ceausescu... He doesn't ever fit in, right? He's not, he certainly doesn't fit in in this small rural village. Um, he's an anxious kid. He's got a stutter. Um, he seems to be pretty smart. Uh, surviving records indicate he did well in primary school. He had like the third highest grade in his class. But education was never going to be like a focus on his early life. Uh, and in 1929, at age 11, he leaves home. He just is like, fuck, fuck living with an abusive religious fundamentalist. I'm going to go to Bucharest and live with my sister. Um, so he at moves 11. in with her and he, yeah, at 11. <laughs> I didn't do shit Life was when I was hard 11. back then. Yeah. yeah. 11 yeah. is like a hard 28 <laughs> like yeah. nowadays. Yeah. 11 is like, 11 is like 28 from like the, the grizzledest guy that you knew in your twenties. Right. Like, yeah. 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 He, yeah tough he as is, nails. This guy's like, yeah, he, I he, lift he, for he, ultimate he, fighting. So yeah, he has are, as many stories of woe as like a 75 year old Irish farmer by this yeah. point. Like, it's like when you see those like pictures of like 25 year olds coming back from war, mm -hmm. and you're just like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. 
So he he gets to Bucharest. He moves in with his sister. He's he's working as a shoemaker. And this is what first brings him into contact with Romania's fairly small communist movement. Because the guy he apprenticed for was a member of the Romanian Communist Party. And he takes Nicolae under his wing. This is an act of pure happenstance. Again, the National Peasants Party is pretty left-wing and a lot more popular. Um, So there's just not a whole lot of people who do fall in with the communists in this period. And the fact that Nikolai wound up under the influence of one of the fairly few active communists in Bucharest is a wild stroke of fate that would prove pretty bad for everyone involved, including the communists. At first, though, Ceausescu just did odd jobs for his boss. The Romanian Communist Party had been made illegal by the king, Um, because royals don't tend to like communists, um, and vice versa. Uh, So even basic things like sending letters and distributing newspapers had to be done underground. It was illegal to advocate for the Communist Party. So Nikolai is kind of a low-level errand boy, helping them do this, helping them keep up communication between different cells, helping them distribute newsletters and all that stuff, and this communist underground that's kind of growing up in Bucharest. Um, He did not occupy a privileged position, and, and to his credit, He seems to be the kind of kid who had no problem throwing down in the street for his beliefs. He is not like um, he's not like taking a taking a the easy jobs. Right. His first arrest. He's not a Twitter pundit here. No, he is not a Twitter pundit. One thing you have to give the kid is that he is putting his skin in the game. His first arrest is at age 15 when he gets picked up in this massive street fight outside of a strike. Basically, he's like siding with a bunch of striking workers and the police show up and he winds up brawling in the street with the fucking cops and such. Hell yeah. Next year. If you're, if if somebody's ever like they were caught brawling in the street with the cops, you're like, all right, like all right, point. Uh, Yeah. Uh, At this point, he's a 15 year old boy who's been arrested for throwing hands in order to defend striking workers. That's cops. Yeah. The next year, he gets busted for circulating a petition protesting the treatment of rail workers who had unionized uh, illegally. Right. So the state is, punishing these workers because they're not allowed to unionize and they try to. And he circulates a petition being like, that's fucked up. And he goes to jail again. Um, so it, it, some historians, there's a debate here between at least the people that I've encountered as to whether or not is Ceausescu a, a committed, ideologically committed communist, or is this kind of just something he falls into and winds up committing to because of other reasons? Um, Kittelin Gria puts it this way. The switch from a world in which he couldn't find his place, his own village, to another in which he still couldn't find his place, the intimidating city, marked him. His initiation into the marginalized movement of the communists was his alternative solution for integrating into social life, says sociologist Pavel Campanu, author of the book Ceausescu, The Countdown. So that's one angle that 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 Campanu and and it certainly seems Gruya are pushing, which is that like he doesn't really fit in anywhere, and the communist movement, even though it is a very fringe and dangerous to be involved with, it offers him like this sense of belonging that he hasn't found anywhere else. So this is kind of his way of having a social life. Um, there's a different argument, and Paul Kenyon makes it in his book, uh, that is also kind of adjacent to that one. It's just, it's interesting. Uh, quote, contemporaries said he had little genuine interest in politics and might easily have chosen the green shirts or uh, the green shirts of Cadriano's Iron Guard, which is like the fascist movement. But Nikolai Ceausescu wanted to meet girls, and some of his friends had told him the prettiest were in the Communist Party. So, I don't know. Maybe both of those things are true, that he falls in with the communists because it's the it, kind of the only place he fits in socially. And also part of why he thinks he'll fit in socially there is someone tells him the prettiest girls are communists. He seems like um, he might be just going with the flow that his ideologies are not yeah. ironclad. That he's just like, yeah, is there pussy yeah. over there? All right, well, I'm going to go to there. I think that seems realistic that like he's looking for friends and he's looking to hit on chicks and the communists offer him that opportunity. And also over time, as he like, fights with them in the street and does time he just kind of gets more committed because when you when you do prison time for a cause maybe you wind up reading about it (laughs) which i think is kind of the way his 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 story goes also you don't want to double you want to double down if you've done damn if like you've damaged yourself because of your commitment to a belief it's so much harder to reject that belief than it is to be like let me tell you why i was right i still defend my choice to get a sega genesis over a super nintendo even though i know i was wrong well and as i always say being a sega genesis kid in the 90s is the being a communist 
underground activist of of 1920s Romania. You know, same, uh, essentially identical experiences, right down to the fact that, Jeff, you in the 1970s wound up in charge of a small Eastern European nation that you then led into tremendous calamity. How did I do it? You know, <laughs> things just happen. <laughs> you should, at least you didn't get a dream cast. Then, then we'd be dealing with a death toll in the millions. Oh, let me um, tell you. Yeah. I had a friend. You could just bootleg games on Dreamcast. <sighs> what a time that was. You could just kids, burn games. Kids these days, you Gen Zers don't know with your with your Steams and your whatever Nintendos you got now. We we used to have real variety in gaming. There was that game with the dolphin. There was Echo the Dolphin, yeah. Taxi game that was kind of like Grand Theft Auto. Crazy there was taxi. that Simpsons game that was a ripoff of that taxi game. Oh, it Simpsons was a glorious game. age. Yeah. Uh-huh. What, what yeah. a time to be alive. That so, was, I, I worked at a video game. I worked at the Toys R Us video game section then. So I'm like, oh, I can name all of these things. <laughs> so Nikolai Ceausescu is, uh, you know, he's the, um, he's the, he's the Sega Dreamcast uh, 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 owner of the, of the Romanian political spectrum, I guess. Um, by which I mean, he was very, very vocal about his beliefs and very committed at a certain point, at least, to them. But he was also not the most competent activist. And a number of his fellow communists would later argue that, like, the fact that he kept getting arrested for the cause was not evidence that he was, like, a very good at what he was doing. More just that, like, he was he had like a short fuse and would get into fights and he kept getting arrested and he was bad at hiding from the cops and, and not getting scooped up. Um, Everyone's like, let's put him in charge of everything. Yeah. Yeah. This guy well, that's actually, fist fighting everybody in the streets. <laughs> one of the fun things about Ceausescu is no one ever says that. And he winds up in charge anyway. <laughs> He's, you know, it's, it's very Andrew Jackson energy. Yeah. Um, yes, he is. He, he there's, he'll have one or two things in common with Jackson. Um, although I guess his big wheel of cheese would have been filled with maggots. Although I think Jackson's big wheel of cheese was probably filled with maggots too. Um, so regardless, the fact that he keeps doing time and he keeps getting the fuck beaten out of him by the cops and tortured and all that stuff, obviously this earns him respect, even from the people who are like, Jesus, dude, like try running, you know, <laughs> like try not getting arrested escaping. every time you go out into the street. See, That's a New um, England thing, too, where it's like, yeah. I know I'm going to die, but I'm going to fight you in this public restroom. Yeah, exactly. Like, what are you doing? Like, Yeah. The entire world is his waffle house in South Carolina. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he, he, he gets busted repeatedly. Um, his biggest prison sentence so far comes when he gets sentenced to two years in 1938. Um, and, and by that time he is a, a pretty notable figure in the Romanian communist party, even though he's not universally respected. Now, 1938 is an important year in Romanian politics. After the death of King Ferdinand, his young son, Michael was technically regent, but a council of guys governed in his stead. They were sympathetic to the main conservative party in Romania. And when the national peasants party wins a resounding victory in the 28 elections, the head of the national peasants party decides to try and reduce his enemy's power by bringing in a new king, right? So you've got this child king who has like this guy basically governing for him as a as regent, um, and that guy is sympathetic to the conservatives. So when this kind of liberal left party takes power, they decide, well, if we bring in a new king who wants to work with us, then we can sideline this guy, and that'll be good for the peasants' party. Unfortunately, the new king they pick is Prince Carol II. Now, Carol II, up to this point, has been like a playboy royal. He spent actually a lot of his life outside Romania because he falls in love with this chick, but he's not allowed to marry her because she's not royal enough. So he's like, fuck you, mom and dad. the Justinian move, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go live somewhere else with this broad. Um, and he had been, as far as I can tell, kind of apolitical most of his life. Again, he's mostly interested in, like, fucking and partying um, and was probably most famous in, in when at the outbreak of world war one, he's in a military unit. Like a lot of Royals are, and he immediately deserts. He's just like, absolutely not. Hell yeah, <laughs> I, I man. Am, I am not doing a world war one. So again, unproblematic so far. 
But once he gets brought in as king, he, he well, I mean, he immediately proves to be problematic, actually. So Carol II effectively derails the progressive land justice oriented policies of the National Peasants Party while playing the conservative and the growing far right parties off of each other. And this is a pretty impressive balancing act at the time that he's able to kind of like weaponize all these groups against each other to solidify his own power. Throughout this period, the Great Depression hits, and Romania is obviously suffering as much as, at least as much as everywhere else is. And the fact that Carol II is kind of derailing the Peasants' Party's ability to push for real reform leads for, leaves a lot of voters to abandon them and abandon kind of the progressive left and start siding with these weird domestic fascists uh, that have started to become very popular in Romania called the Iron Guard. That could um, never the, I- happen here. No, no, no. It only happens in Romania this one time. So the Iron Guard are also called the Legionaries or the Legionary Movement. Again, like Romania, there's a big heart on, especially in kind of like the nationalist side of things for, for Roman history. So they are kind of consciously like talking back to their Roman heritage and calling these guys the Legionary Movement. Um, The Iron Guard are founded by a fascist death squad member and a medieval mystic uh, named Cornelio Codriano. Um, and Cadriano, we'll do an episode on him at some point. He's a fascinating fascist and one that we don't talk about enough. He's fascinating. Um, He is fascinating. Um, he is kind of a mix between like, he, he, there's an element of him that's like the Gavin McGinnis proud boy type where he forms this street fighting organization. But he also like, he becomes famous because he assassinates a dude. Like he, one of the things he's, he tells his young followers is you need to be forming death squads and murdering people. And it's okay if we get executed. Like that's actually dope. If we get killed for assassinating leftists, like that's a thing that we should seek to do. Um, so he, hmm. he definitely sucks. Another one of his beliefs is that he needs to follow other thousands of children with women at all levels of Romanian society because the saint that he liked, he believes did that too. Um, so that's he's, a good he's, way to find a saint, man. Mm-hmm, yep, Which saint this, is all about straight fucking this horny fascist uh 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 fucking mystic who yeah dresses like a medieval like basically dresses in Ren fair gear marching from town to town and inciting pogroms right that's Codrianu's like primary method of uh of like pushing. He's on tour like he's yeah. on an anti-semitic yeah. tour yeah now obviously hitler loves this guy hitler is a big Codrianu fan um and as his movement pendant. gains power the nazis start shipping guns over to the iron guard right kind of like underground here have some guns we'll we'll be over there pretty soon guys so get ready um th- king carol the second he finds the iron guard useful in some ways and he's you know perfectly willing to overlook a few pogroms even though his mistress is jewish um because he's like hey you know, whatever helps me, whatever helps me stop these peasant people from reducing the power of, of wait, the royals. Wait, yeah. Political anti-Semites were selective in their choice of enforcement. That's unheard shocking. Of. Another thing that only occurred once in Romania. So King Carol II generally considers the fascists useful, whereas the socialists and the peasants party people, they want to reduce his power. So he he, he sides with them a, a lot throughout the 20s. Um, and early 30s. But then in like 1937, the Iron Guard starts to win larger and larger shares of the vote. I think they top out at like 22% of the vote in the 37 election. Um, and he's like, oh shit, well, I can't really control these guys necessarily, right? Like they they were, they, uh, it was a good bet to back them earlier, but now Kodrianu's like getting within spitting distance of real power and he doesn't owe me anything, right? Like he's not, I, I can't actually trust this guy. He could fuck me up even worse than these peasants party people would. So Carol II starts to panic. It's so hard for me not to hear you go party people whenever you say <laughs> yeah. party people, by the way. Yeah, I mean, most of these parties would have would have sucked ass i mean I, I assume the national peasants party parties would would have been okay yeah, not a lot of um, there it is happening at yeah these apparently hey all the all the hot people are at the communist party so that sounds that sounds like it could be good um although you might wind up fucking nikolai ceausescu which is a mixed bag although sophie says he's hot so you know sophie is I, down only mm-hmm. one photo okay. i take it back only one photo okay. Oh, he was just one of those guys that got caught at a good angle they once, got, so he's hot it, forever it in like, history books. It looked almost <laughs> like a mugshot. I don't know if it actually is or not, but there was like one photo, and then you like look at the rest, and you're like, oh no. It's oh, like everyone no. sharing the hot Stalin photo. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is not not accurate. Shockingly, you, you can't rely on, uh, <laughs> on on pictures of Joseph Stalin to know yeah. how he actually looked. Um, but you know what you so, can rely on, Robert? Us and no one else? The pro- the, and the products and services that support the show. Well, sure. I just don't separate between us and the oh, products and services that support our show. You know, we're one beautiful amalgam that you should just dive into and let it, let it, let it subsume you. Swim in us. I mean, if swim you, in us. I, stop. <laughs> just absorb Never. it in here. You know what? Yeah. I love goods and services that are provided by the uh, sponsors of this podcast. And as a matter of fact, I it should be known that I am a subscriber slash purchaser slash user of all mm-hmm. of these mm-hmm. things. Yeah, Jeff's buying gold. He's joined the Washington State Highway Patrol. Um, he's he's doing all of the things our sponsors are just to do. He's engaging yes. in sports betting. <laughs> yep, yep. I'm doing all those things. Just, uh, just really doing them. And we're back. So, in the 1937 elections, the Iron Guard win like 20% of the vote. And the Peasants' Party has like a collapse of their power. You know, they, they'd gotten something north of like 70% a few years ago, and they get 32% of the vote in that election, which is short of the, I mean, that means that they have, they do technically the best, but they need 40% of the vote to form a government, right? So since they don't meet that threshold, the king's going to get to help form the government, and that's, that's, that's not going to end well. And I'm going to quote from the book Children of the Night here. And now it was for the king to decide who would become prime minister. He knew the public wanted to change and began looking down the table of results. In fourth place, behind Codriano's legionaries, was the moderately fascist National Christian Party, led by Octavian Goga. The anti-Semitic poet was a great friend and supporter of the king and Codriano's most bitter rival. He had scored just 9% of the vote. As far as Carroll was concerned, he was perfect for the job. Anti- <laughs> Anti-Semitic poet is the yeah. most fascinating combination of two words in history yeah just 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 a racist po- but a moderate yeah. fascist yeah That's there'd be nice. like nazi ballerina like mm-hmm. there's just there's certain words that you don't necessarily <laughs> conflate the two things together yeah uh, and you don't also you don't hear a lot of moderate fascists uh these days but i guess it is i mean it is actually a thing in this period like it's a it's reasonable to draw a line between the two of them because the iron guard um and the national christian party are pretty pretty bitter rivals and yeah. spend a lot of time fighting each other i would add um, that so, i would add that we have that here with the the quote law and order uh yeah. the people that that really they're like well you know i don't believe in all of these things but you know we should make sure that anybody that commits a crime is shot in the face yeah, yeah, it's the, it's those weirdos who are like, I think we should execute people for spraying graffiti during protests, but also fuck the January 6th folks, where it's like, yeah, you're a moderate fascist. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, just a, a diet um, fascist, a little. Yeah, yeah. So so that's who, uh, that's who uh, this moderate fascist poet, uh, anti-Semite Goga, gets made prime minister by the king. And within two days of his appointment, um, th- he has shut down both of the large Jewish owned newspapers in Romania. Um, he has the Bucharest bar suspend the licenses of every Jewish lawyer that they can find. Uh, he rescinds the right to sell liquor and tobacco by Jewish shopkeepers. Um, and he withdraws citizenship from all 225,000 naturalized Romanian Jews. Now so, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Uh huh. Not, co- not cool. Not cool. Not cool. Not cool. Sorry uh, if and, I'm a, and, sorry if I'm courting controversy here, but that is this, an uncool move. Kind of a dick move, some would say. And, and, and this podcast is brought to you by the letter P for pogroms, because that's what that's what comes next. Is there's a bunch of pogroms? Are they a sponsor? Because um, I don't support that <laughs> <laughs> that specific one. I do not do. I do not. I do not consume that. Yeah. That. I mean, uh, we we never know who's going to sponsor the show in the programmatic ads, so it's not impossible. But we 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 do we do we do have a hard no pogrom line in yeah. our in our ad sheet. Yeah. And now um, back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> yeah. Um. So there's a bunch of pogroms. There's also fighting in the streets uh, between well, yeah. Kodriano's green shirts uh, and between these moderate fascists, right? Because they're the green shirts are angry that they don't get the full fascism. They get some pogroms, but not all of the pogroms that they the, had wanted. The um, idea of a moderate anything getting into a fist fight is just very ironic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I want racism. I want slightly re- less racism. Yeah. And then I want a little less racism, but still street. some racism. So this is all uh, basically a, a, a con by King Carol. Like he knows that, well, if I put, you know, this fucking Goga guy in power, he's going to do a bunch of horrible shit. And also the legionaries are going to try to do them an uprising. And it's going to be this big gnarly mess. And it is this big gnarly mess. And he uses that to be like, Hey guys, parliamentary democracy just can't work for some reason. So you know what? We're putting an end to that. I'm suspending the constitution. And now I'm the dictator King. Uh, so he does that in the 10th of February, 1938, he becomes the dictator King of Romania. Um, so that's cool. Good, good for him. Uh, and he's not going to be good at this, right? Carol the second is kind of shitty at everything. Um, the good thing that he does, I will give him credit for one thing, which is that he has Codrianu murdered. Um, they arrest him and a bunch of his supporters and just execute them at a black site, basically. Um, and that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not against that. Um, but he mainly executes Codrianu because he's creating his own fascist movement that is very deliberately ripping off the legionaries. He basically like does the, does the fucking Kirkland brand, uh, iron <laughs> guard movement. Um, Classic. and in fact, like it, Hitler, and the Nazis will like make fun of him for being a fake fascist. They're like, look at this guy. He's not even like a yeah. real fascist. He's just copying yeah. this dude it's, he murdered. It's like when Transformers um, came out and sci fi had transmorphers. Yeah, yeah. He is the transmorphers of Romanian fascism. Um, he also steals a huge percentage of the national budget to siphon into his private bank account for when he inevitably gets forced out of the country and has to abdicate. We couldn't have this happen. happening soon. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we would not have this happening anytime soon in America. No, 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 of course not. Of course not, because we don't call them kings. So it's fine. Yeah, so it's not um, the same thing, yeah. Yeah, so the you know, he's he's not a very successful royal dictator. He is not going to last long. Um and while he is kind of trying to solidify his hold on power, the USSR and Nazi Germany are deciding that, you know, why can't we be friends? Which is what that song is about, actually. It's about the yeah. Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Um, so the USSR and the Nazis have them a pact, and they're like, "What if we? What if we met in Poland and and kissed at the line we draw and and enforce with an unbelievable quantity of human blood?" To be um, fair, by the way, that song is by the band War. Mm-hmm. So oh, it right. really, it really does mm-hmm. fit. It does. It's actually kind of perfect. Um, so, yeah, the USSR and Nazi Germany are like briefly BFFs in in taking Poland. And the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, a lot of people don't know this, but it contains some secret provisions. And one of those secret provisions is the Nazi saying, Stalin, you can take Bessarabia from Romania, which is Bessarabia is like one of the wealthiest parts of Romania. It's like literally a third of like the population and the economy of Romania is, is in Bessarabia. So when the Soviets move in and take it, Romania is like Hitler, come on guy. We're kind of fascists. What you, you, you want to have our back? And Hitler's like, no man, you killed my boy Codrianu. Fuck you guys. So this doesn't work great for anybody. It does certainly does not increase Carol. The second's popularity back home. Um, so that's going to be one of the reasons why he doesn't last very long. And while all this is going on right in the late thirties, you've got this fascist movement becoming ascendant. Um, you've got increasing crackdowns on the communists. There's maybe 700 of them, many of whom are not free in the country at this point in time. Um, but Ceausescu, you know, manages to stay alive. Uh, he, in part because the fascists are not obviously like the Romanian fascists, like all fascists have a lot of anti-communist rhetoric, but the communists are not the Iron Guard's focus because there's just not that many of them, right? It's not like they they're actually have bigger threats from the state. Um, and so that's who they focus on. And so, you know, while Ceausescu is continuing his, his string of getting arrested for a bunch of bullshit, he doesn't, you know, get murdered by the Nazis. And he doesn't, I don't think, spends a particularly large amount of time fighting with them in the street. What he does do is spend a lot of time hitting on the women of the Romanian Communist Party. This is how, in 1939, he meets his future wife, Elena Petrescu. She had grown up in a tiny rural village like Nikolai and become a communist after moving to the city. Elena did not do well in school. Unlike Nikolai, she does not appear to be a good uh, book learner. Um, She failed basically every class. But in the 1930s, she gets a job at a black market pill mill and decides that 
this means that she's a chemist. So she's her chemist. lifelong ambition yeah. is going to be to become a chemist because she works at a pill mill that's basically reverse engineering diet pills and and then pressing them. Um, I mean, look, just kind honestly, of funny. if you work in a place that's going to war a lot, having what is essentially speed mm-hmm. on demand. That's great. And Give me some of that bootleg not ephedrine a or bad whatever idea. So in the summer of 1939, the Romanian Communist Party holds a picnic uh, and a small fair that like includes a, a fundraising competition. And they, the way they do this competition is that like the, uh, all of the girls get together and they give each of them a number. Um, and the girl who is able to basically sell the most tickets to raise funds at this party is named Queen of the Ball. Now, Elena is not a charismatic person. Um, she is not good at talking to people. She does not like crowds. She is not social. She is not someone who is going to be very good at selling tickets on her own. But Nikolai seems to pretty much falls in love with her at first sight. Um, he has just gotten out of prison for distributing communist propaganda at this point. And he is like, uh, she obviously likes him too. Cause he's this like hard son of a bitch. who's just gotten out of prison. He's like a fighter for the party. And so they make eyes and kind of as his first gesture to win her favor, he threatens to beat up all of his friends if they don't buy tickets from Elena, uh, in order to, so that she can win, uh, queen of the ball. Uh, which is <laughs> both will show because in the future he is going to do like the nationwide version of this, like sending out squads to beat the shit out of people who don't vote for the Communist Party. Um, she also, she looks like uh, the kid from Dick Tracy. Yeah, like she looks she, she also certainly known does as, like the nerd from Can't Hardly Wait. If you remember, yeah. like she looks exactly like that, dude. Yeah, she is. Uh, that, that's a good way of looking at her. And she's and, a handsome uh, woman. Nikolai Ceausescu looks like a Muppet version of a communist. Um, like he's got that big head that you could, if you look at a picture of adult Ceausescu, you can't imagine him talking normally. You can only imagine the looks entire like top of his head flapping backwards. Yeah. Um, he looks like Sam Eagle. Yeah, he does. Yes. He has strong Sam Eagle characteristics. So, um, this is, I don't know, it's kind of sweet. It's it, There's a darker tone to it because he's going to like violently fake an election later in his life. Um, but it's kind of sweet now that he's doing that to, to you know, make this girl he likes feel pretty. So that's, that's kind of nice. Um, <laughs> in I the mean, future. Yeah. yeah. If she, yeah. If, the thing is, is like, look, not for nothing, but seeing her win a beauty contest, I'd be like, all right, well, this is clearly a fix, right? <laughs> Well, yeah. Um, Apologies to her family. No, no. I mean, her family is terrible. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, that that goes great for uh, him and the two of them hook up and they get married and he's going to spend a lot more time in prison, but they seem to have legitimately been a love match. Now, normally that's sweeter than it turns out to be because they are both some of the worst people who have ever lived, but I'll, I'll give them one thing. They, they seem to have been legitimately in love. So that's... That's yeah. Monsters can be in love. That's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, in 1940, Carol, the second's dictatorship collapses, uh, with some help from the Nazis and the new cat in town is a military man named Marshall Antonescu, who basically runs a military dictatorship with fascist trappings. Um, he uses the iron guard. Um, he like puts them adjacent to power, but Antonescu, he's a monster, but he's not ideologically a fascist. Like, you can like again this is where we get into the terms because he like is a major player in the holocaust he's a terrible terrible person i'm not saying that to be like he's not as bad as these fascists he just he is a military dictator he is not a fascist dictator and he doesn't really like the iron guard all that much he's willing to use them because he has he's a strong nationalist um but he considers them way too radical to actually run things. And while all this is going on, all of Romania's communists are either in prison or hiding out in the USSR. And again, there's maybe six or 700 of them in the country still. The leaders of the movement in Romania are Anna Pocher, a Jewish woman and a veteran revolutionary Stalinist, and Georgi Georgiou Day. He's an electrician who became an illegal train union organizer and spends uh, some of Ceausescu's first arrests are f- like supporting his uh, uh, Georgiou Day's um, um, illegal train strikes. And he's also a Stalinist. Everybody's a Stalinist, right? Um, 
So Georgie was a poor peasant uh, with what Marxists considered unimpeachable proletarian pedigrees. He's basically like the the archetype of the kind of guy Stalin pushed as the ideal new Soviet man. He's this like born poor, working his entire life, organizing unions and fighting in the streets to support the rights of, of workers to organize. Pocker, meanwhile, she's also does a lot of time for the cause. She is a tough lady. In fact, she gets the nickname the Iron Woman of the Iron Lady of Romania. But she's also an intellectual, right? She's one of these people who comes to communism like through reading about it and and is is a is a like as opposed to like George Day does not read books, right? Does not does not talk a lot about uh, reading. He's not citing a whole lot of like passages from no. Marxist tracts, which Pawker is. Um, she is fiercely devoted to the cause, um, which but the fact that she's also on kind of this creative ideological side of things means that she's going to run into conflict during the messy early years of the USSR. And and for a little while, Pawker is in Stalin's good books. She she flees to the USSR for a period. She goes to this Soviet school for revolution where she studies tactics to help her build the covert communist movement in Romania. But she also encounters a lot of difficulties because, uh, number one, she's Jewish, and number two, she's a woman. And so those things yeah. are rougher. Not good at the time. Not not great at the time. Um, now it's perfect and, for all of those people, especially in America. Yeah, yeah, everything's everything's fine now. Um, but but back at the time, back, back in the day, difficult. Uh, and she also runs into problems because she, she runs afoul of Stalin, and she gets executed for be or and and her husband gets executed for being a Romanian spy, right? Um, I don't believe he is. I've never seen any evidence that Pocker's husband was spying for anyone. He seems to have been a really committed communist, but he gets executed over in the USSR. And Anna finds out about it while she's four years into a ten year prison sentence in Romania. Uh, she had formed a group of prisoners called the Women's Collective of Anti-Fascist Prisoners. And when the news reaches them that Anna's husband has been executed, she doesn't even get time to mourn him before the other women demand that she explain why she'd married a traitor. A criticism session is held in prison in which Anna is blamed for not warning the party that her husband was an agent provocateur. And eventually Anna tells them, I am now racking my brain to find something, a sign of any kind that would have led me to believe he was an enemy of the people. I'm not placing any doubt on the party's decision. The party knows better than I, but I did not see anything. And as much as I search my soul, my recollections, my memory, I don't find anything that could prove such a thing. Which is like almost certainly true and kind of a devastating thing to imagine this woman who's stuck in prison, who's just found out the love of her life has been killed by the state and is now like, well, I, the party must have been right in killing him, but I just didn't see a sign of it. Um, it's super fucked up. And yeah, the rest I guess of this, the best way yeah. to handle that is to just be like, well, look, I'm sure the people that are still alive with the guns, they had great reason to do that. <laughs> I'm just saying I personally didn't see it, but they, they probably nailed that shit. I it, just, it, maybe he was tricking me. It, it doesn't go well for her because she doesn't, she, she does not like repudiate him fully. Yeah. And so these these ladies that she's formed into a group in prison, like send back word to Stalin saying Anna won't denounce her dead husband. Um, and this winds up being one of the justifications Stalin would later use for backing Georgie over Anna because yeah, she she winds up. Yeah, uh, it would be funny if it was like a real suppressed. true lies scenario where he was like this huge jacked, like Austrian sounding guy. It's like I sell computers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a communist. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It doesn't work out that way, uh, unfortunately. Um, but yeah. Um, any okay, in any case, uh, Georgie Georgiou Day also spends his war years locked away in a fascist prison because the Antonescu regime is not quite as Nazi as the straight up Nazis wanted it to be. Um, communists in concentration camps there did have a higher rate of survival than they did in like Germany. So what actually happens is once all these people get thrown into these prisons, they kind of settle out what the communist government of the future Romania is going to be in these prison cells, which is a thing that happens every time you throw a bunch of radical revolutionaries into prison cells together is they wind up sorting out the future regime that they're going to uh bring into power at a certain yeah, they, point I mean, they got um, they got time yeah exactly they've got time to like yeah. read books about communism and figure yeah. out who's going to do what when they eventually wind yeah. up in power Ooh, when our um, number comes up we're gonna have to go ahead and make a perfect communist government yep and that's exactly what's going to happen um 
So George Uday is obviously, I think everyone kind of is aware just because he's such a powerful person that he's going to wind up being like the top man if they ever do wind up in power. And Ceausescu sees this. And he is, again, he he's, he's got, gets thrown into prison again during the World War II years for conspiring against the social order. And he kind of turns himself into a gopher uh, for George Uday. He makes himself available for like whatever sort of side jobs they need done. He does everything that'll keep it like he doesn't care what he has to do, no, no matter how like banal or low the task is, as long as it's going to keep him on the lips of his betters, right? I, I just want to stay around George Uday, you know, as long as he keeps seeing me and knows me as like this guy who can handle anything he wants. Like that's that's what I'm going to do. Um, He's just jazzed to this, be on the show, man. Yeah, just happy to be here, man. Just happy to be here. Um, And this strategy works worked splendidly, as Paul Kenyon writes. They had a lackey in prison, a young hooligan who brought them food packages and ran messages. His name was Nikolai Ceausescu, a 22-year-old trainee cobbler who was regularly in trouble for fighting and delivering communist leaflets. Some of his fellow inmates thought him weird and said that they avoided him because he was such a bore with absolutely no sense of humor. In the presence of big men like George Uday, Ceausescu remained largely silent and deferential. He avoided speaking whenever possible because of a stutter so severe it made his legs shake, but he also possessed a powerful memory and an instinct intelligence and sat among the future leaders listening to everything they said and slowly learning. And this actually works out well for him because since he's too kind of scared and nervous to speak up or say anything, he never winds up running afoul of George Uday, right? He doesn't, he's never, he puts himself in positions to help with stuff, but he's never running anything that can like go badly and reflect poorly on him. Um, and he, he, pays attention to the social relationships and kind of worms his way closer and closer to George Uday over time, um, which which is the I mean, it, this the, Stalin does a version of this. That's how he rises to power, too. This this is a pretty effective tactic. So if you are ever in a revolutionary underground movement that's seeking to overthrow the state and institute a new form of government, keep an eye out for like the weird, quiet kid who just hangs around doing chores. Shoot that guy pretty quick. Okay, that's, that's something that I advice. do need to have in my in my. Uh, I need yeah. to have that written down. Yeah, Keep just, that in my just back make a pocket. note. <laughs> Drop that kid before he gets too yeah. far. In, in that's where all the problems of, start. Yeah, mm-hmm. gotta get all my moves ready. You know, mm-hmm. legally, and Robert does not mean that literally. I do mean he that does. literally. Yeah, Look, no, he does. Before Robert. you overthrow the government, kill the quiet kid in your movement. Just drop them all. Yeah. What did? What is Look, this? Take Amateur a page hour? out of, Drac- of, take a page out of Dracula's book. Burn them in a thing. Put them all in a building and light it on fire. Only let the loud assholes inherit power because that yeah. will never go badly. No, we've mm-hmm. as we just mostly just get podcasts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and I think that's going to do it for our part one of Ceausescu. And uh, boy, howdy. Have, have you had a good time here, Jeffrey? It's Jeffro? all I could ask for. Jeff Toberfest. That's me. That's, that's that's who I am. I'm glad that you got mm-hmm. my name per- correct. That's right. That's right. That's that's you and the festival dedicated to celebrating your many accomplishments every I, October. I, I got to say, I love being here. Love spending time mm-hmm. with you guys. It's a real blast. I love relearning. Sometimes I'm like that degree I got wasn't worth anything. And then I do this show every once in a while. And I'm like, that's eh, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you got to plug anything here before we roll out. Are people still listening at this point in time when we do plugs? Let's oh, do it, yeah. man. Um, I So uh, depending on when this goes up, uh, I run a stand-up show, a live stand-up show at a toy store in Burbank, California uh, called Mint on Card at a store called Blast from the Past on Magnolia in Burbank, California. You can check that out the second Friday of every month. I have a great podcast called Jeff Has Cool Friends where I interview my friends that I think have really cool jobs and I think you should uh, pay attention to them. You can get that for free or you can get early access to uncensored episodes with bonus content at patreon.com slash Jeff May. It's just my name. Uh, I also have shows like Ugg Fine with Kim Crawl. Isn't that easy? It's so easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ugg Fine, my monthly show with Kim Crawl. And I also have a great show called Nerd with Dre Alvarez that we do. um, We do on the Patreon and for free. Um, And that is uh, we just do deep dives on nerdy shit. I also do Tom and Jeff Watch Batman on the Gamefully Unemployed Network, which we keep needing to bring you on to i know you like the uh, you want to do batman stuff i i do want to do batman stuff by which we'll i mean i want to i want to beat up poor people yeah. in the street while wearing ten thousand dollars in in body in, armor in armor yeah yeah of course yeah. as an, as an <laughs> olympic level athlete yes yeah as, yeah uh, <laughs> 
a and, master uh, martial artist beating the yeah. shit out of a heroin addict in an yep, alley. Perfect. They're, yeah. Just breaking someone's back for stealing a Magnavox. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, you can also hear me on uh, unpopular opinion and you don't even like sports both on the unpops network. Um, other than that, uh, you know, thank you. This is fun. We have fun. here. Yes. I, I had fun here. We like this to is, have good time. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, unsure I wish if I knew I'll better still have health insurance Romanian. after this. That's what I'm saying. Sophie, well, look. There were a lot of things said at the end there, buddy. I'm, I'm not going to give our followers bad advice about how yeah. to form their underground anti-government terrorist cell. The question is, why aren't you giving that advice, Sophie? Because I really yeah, like Sophie. having health insurance. Well, I like making sure that some weird quiet kid doesn't wind up Robert, in charge I, after the revolution this is my and least murders bit you've tens of millions ever of people. done. I thought I, I really? thought I really yes. there's a lot of really? bits you could be I, really not you know, a fan of. Like the, I, I, I've encouraged violence against so many I less hear, deserving I groups. I hear what you're saying and I know that you're like, well, I've done, I've done worse. Uh, and like you have, but I wow. particularly hate Sophie, this. Sophie, Sophie's like tanky my, arc did you has like begun my tonight. Yeah. This, uh-huh. is uh-huh. this is This is good. <laughs> This is, unfortunately, this was Sophie's choice to hate the thing oh, that you yes. uh, like Ah, yes. Sophie's doing. choice joke. We did it. Get it? We did, the, it? Whole, we did from... the whole thing. <laughs> and she has a Boston accent in that movie. No. Yep. No. So do I. Anyway, that's going to be the episode. Come back <sighs> tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow, but soon. Thursday. Uh, and and there will be more. More Ceausescu. Sweet. Less Romanian uh, uh, history. More more getting into the weeds of Ceausescu. So stick around for that, folks. It ends in uh, tens of thousands of starving orphans. As it always does. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.